Okay, so right now I'd like to take the time to inter introduce and recognize um, CCAR's executive committee, our 2021 president, Ron Leach, our 2021 president elect, Marissa Benet, and our 2021 secretary treasurer, Shauna Aquisto, and our 2021 immediate past president, David Long. I'd also like to take the time to recognize our national and state leadership, 2021 NAR first vice president, Leslie Ruth Smith, 2021 Texas Realtors Chairman Marvin Jolly, our 2021 PAC Trustee Region 4 Brenda Rogers Moon, and our 2021 PIC Region 4 David Long. And I'd also like to recognize and thank all of our BDM, BDM advertisers who have been hanging in there graciously since 2020. Um, without their support, these meetings would not be possible and continue to be possible when we meet in person again. So please remember that to support them with your business. And I'd now like to introduce today's guest speaker, Kelly Milligan. Kelly joined Chicago Title in 2006 as Dallas Area Council for the company's direct corporate owned operations in North Texas. In this position, Kelly serves as a valuable resource to our industry, providing advice and assistance on all manner of issues faced by realtors, brokers, homeowners, and businesses. Kelly is a graduate of the University of Kansas and Georgetown University Law Center. After graduation, he spent 15 years in private practice, dividing his time between civil trial law, labor relations, and transactional matters for clients across the nation. After discovering that his dog and children were genuinely frightened of him, he made the decision to move in-house and join Chicago Title. Kelly is a member of the State Bar of Texas, the Federal Society, the Texas Land Title Association, and the TLTA Political Action Committee. He is an affiliate member of Texas Realtors and the Collin County Association of Realtors, where he has served on the board of directors. He is acti actively involved in government affairs and fundraising for TREEPAC as a Sterling R member. Kelly lives in Plano with his wife, Jenny, a second generation Collin County Realtor, son, Jack, 24, and a third year law student in SMU, daughters, Mary, Kate, 16, and Ginger, 12, and a veritable menagerie of dogs, cats, birds, and fish. In his spare time, he enjoys music, good books, cooking, and self-medicating. Please welcome Kelly. All right, I had to unmute. Old man using technology. There's always <laughs> kind of some hazards to that. I'm attempting to screen share. Can y'all tell me, are you seeing the slideshow? Do we have it set up correctly? Yes. Okay, good. That's a tremendous hurdle for me. If I've got that done, then uh, we're really not in bad shape here. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for being here today and uh, just let you know how much I appreciate you coming out. These things are always weird using the Zoom format. I know we're all looking forward to that time in the not too distant future, whenever it may be, when we can go back to having meetings in person and actually interacting and uh, you know all the things that come with the meeting. Um, with respect to this presentation, as it applies to the Zoom format, one of the things that I most enjoy about doing this for the association when I do is the opportunity to take questions from the audience. You know, when I'm able to interact with everybody and see a raised hand and take a question, it's more fun, it's easier. <clears throat> Much harder to do during Zoom. If I can figure out how to make the chat thing work, and I'm not even sure that I can because at least at the moment, I'm not even knowing what I'm looking at. I, I can kind of see some pictures on the right side of my screen and I'm sort of focused on my PowerPoint. It, it'll be hard for me to kind of see the chat function, although I will try. But the bottom line is when I'm done, I will just shut up and we'll open it up to questions for those of you that have them. And in the meantime, if you've seen this before, you know the drill. We're gonna go through a lot of information and we're gonna go through it fairly quickly. Um, if you want copies of the PowerPoint, what I would suggest is that you email me at the conclusion of the meeting and that email address is kelly.milligan at ctt.com. I'll, uh, I'll find a way to get that into the chat function for everybody a little later, but uh, that'll be a way that I can get it for you. And then you don't feel like you have to write down all of this or try to, because it can be kind of like drinking from a fire hose. So with that, let's uh, let's kick into the substance of the presentation, such as it may be. Um, oh, dear God. Yeah, here we go. Trying to make the, the slides advance. There we go. All right, good. At the end of our last episode, i.e. when I did this before, we had uh, basically come off of a tremendous year. When we started the beginning of 2020, we were coming off of a 2019 that was really outstanding. And, uh, you know, basically that, that set the stage for what we thought was gonna be another great year. 2019 started out a little rough. We had a situation where interest rates actually went up during the early part of the year. So it slowed the momentum of our market in January and February. But once we took off during the late first and second quarter, it really lit a fuse. And as a result, we wound up having another best year in the history of our market, 
108,000 sales, total dollar volume of just about 34 billion. For Dallas Plano Irving, our side of the Metroplex, we were up 4% almost on sales for nearly 23.6 billion. Median sale price rose by 2.4%. Looking at it just in terms of Collin County, 17,000 sales, that was a 3% increase for 6.45 billion. And you can see in every county of the Metroplex, sales, dollar volume, median sale price up. The only negative really for 2019 is the same negative we've had for years anyway, that being inventory, which uh, just continues to be an epic suck fest on a par with like a Nickelback album, and it got even worse during the course of 2019. But the good news, of course, was that the national and state economies continued to chug along. So coming out of 2019, we were sanguine. We felt quite positive about what we thought the market would do for us in 2020. Toward that end, here is a copy of the slide from last year's PowerPoint wherein we made our predictions for what would happen in 2020. And as you can see, it was generally pretty positive, though there are a couple of key caveats we might want to isolate. The first involves interest rates. We expected that interest rates, which were then around 3.65 for a 30 year fixed, would quote, remain low, quote. What I don't think we really recognized, and I don't know that anybody did, was that they would not only stay that low, but go considerably lower as they did in the course of 2020. For much of the year, they were down close to, to three and in some cases under it. So had we known rates were gonna go that low, I think it might've changed our prediction. But based on the assumption that they'd stay about where they were, maybe at that three and a half mark, we expected a, a slight increase in sales, maybe another one to 2%. And then of course, another key caveat that we all sort of took in mind going into 2020 was no major economic disruptions. We were expecting kind of laboratory conditions and obviously that's not quite what we got. But by and large, we expected that it would be a good year for our market in 2020. I don't think anybody though really had any way of knowing or expecting just what we would end up getting as 2020 unfolded. The first thing that we didn't expect was that January and February were going to be absolutely incredible. Home sales for January last year were 21% higher than they were in 2019, largest single month percentage increase in four years, um, almost 6,400 homes in January we've ever had on record, dollar volume up almost 30%. The other thing that was worth noting was you had a lot of people predicting that sale prices would maybe go lower actually. Uh, George Ratu from Realtor.com thought prices were going to drop in the Metroplex and right out of the gate we had an 8% increase in median sale price. With over 9,300 pendings for February, we knew that February of 2021 was going to be a good month and it was. Almost 7,200 homes sold. That's a 10% increase for 2.4 billion. So here you are, January and February of 2020, we are already 7% percentage points higher than we were Oh, at that same point in 2019, 2019 being the best year in the history of our market. So we could see two months into the year that we were very well positioned to have another outstanding year. Median sale price in February continued to go up beyond expectations, going up at a 6% clip. The negative, of course, was inventory. It was low to begin with. But the strong start depleted what inventory we had, dropping the numbers by about 6%. So we got to the point where there were about 20,000 homes listed at the end of February. And with the pendings that we had for March, we knew that number would go down even further. Now, when we talk about January and February of last year, context is important. They were very good months, however you want to measure it. They look a lot better maybe than they really were because January and February of 2019 were inordinately slow. That interest rate hike that raised rates during the early part of 2019 kind of chilled transaction volume. If you compare the first two months of 2020 with 2018, it's not so dramatic an increase, but juxtaposed against 2019, it looks somewhat more significant than it was. Either way though, pretty good start to the year, however you want to measure it. Then though came the month of March. I have distinct memories of March last year, and even though it was a year ago, in some ways it seems like absolutely yesterday. I was speaking at an office down in the Park Cities uh, that first week of March, when some of you will remember this day, the stock market plummeted. It went down so far so fast that they had to hit the breakers on trading and everybody take a time out for a little bit. And people were reading all this on their phones as this was happening and a lot of people were very concerned. And we actually spent some time talking about what that really meant. And I had to tell people, I didn't think it was the end of the world. This wasn't 1929, it wasn't even 1986. It was just a little weird, watch this space. 
the other thing about March, obviously, is this was the month when the coronavirus or COVID-19 really kind of caught the public consciousness. People knew about it in general terms in January and February. I don't know that anybody expected that it would have the impact that it did. And coming into March, it really hadn't done much of anything. But by the middle of March, life as we know it had pretty much been postponed, canceled, or locked down. Um, I personally was asked to work from home starting that week of, I think it was the, the 15th or 16th. And I remember the first full day that I worked from home, I went on the morning show for KLIF 570 with Amy Shadroff, and as they were, and they wanted to talk to me about what the lockdown and COVID would mean for the real estate market. As I was waiting to go on, the producer was pre-interviewing me, and it was very clear that they had a narrative in mind. They understood that prices were going to go down, and that was what they wanted to tell people. So they were asking me how big the price decreases were that we were seeing, where were we seeing them the most, and I had to explain not only that we weren't seeing them because it was too early for the market to register the effect of the lockdown, but that we weren't going to, and I explained why, and my theory was this. The market was fundamentally healthy. All that we were having in the form of this lockdown was kind of a timeout. The activity would stop for a little while, but when the music started up again, demand would be just as robust as it was before. And if anything, I predicted that we would see more demand in the Metroplex because there were a lot of places in the country that were handling COVID different than we were, and people were going to want to get the hell out of there and come to Texas. So if anything, my prediction was that once the market kind of reopened, you would see it get very, very hot. And they acted like I was smoking crack when I explained this on the air. But, you know, you can see the numbers when we're done talking. Bottom line, though, by the middle of March, we were in a bit of a fix. Uh, Dallas County had shut down everything that was non-essential. And we didn't know whether real estate was essential or not. Judge Jenkins didn't clarify that in his order. We had a little more clarity in Collin and Denton counties. We were, we were able to do what we needed to do in practicing real estate. Uh, but you can see the chart there that kind of gives you some idea of how the cases unfolded. February, March, not much. Even as we were locking down, you see the extent of the increase. And then the first big peak that we had in late July or early August. But March was really the game changer for us. And yet when the numbers came out at the end of the month, they weren't bad at all. Even with the economy being on ice for half the month, we sold 9,300 homes, which was a 4% increase over 2019. And despite all of these people predicting that prices were going to plummet, basically that didn't happen. Dollar volume was uh, up just under $3 billion, up 6%. So for the first quarter of 2020, total sales were up 9% over the first quarter of 2019, and median sale price was up 6%. We got a very good start to the year with that first quarter, even though COVID was starting to have its impact, but the clouds were clear. We could see that pendings were off 10% for April and new listings were down 9%, probably more than that. People just didn't want strangers tromping through their house. Nobody knew what the state of the market would be. So listings, which were bad to begin with, just got worse. And in the meantime, all of us were grappling with what the conditions were going to be. Could we do our business? Could we do open houses? Could we even show properties? And until we got clarity there, bottom line, we just had more confusion and terror in the real estate community than any kind of clarity. So the month of March, not a great deal of fun. And April, well, April pretty much sucked. And of course, when we talk about things that suck, we always like to talk about our good friend, the sea lamprey, which has no jaw. And therefore, when it wants to eat something, the sea lamprey sucks on its food. They like butterscotch pudding for that exact reason. And much like the lamprey, April totally sucked. Sales down 17%, biggest decline we'd seen in a decade. And again, not because of fundamentals in the market, just because everything had been put on ice. Fortunately, thanks to a strong first quarter, total sales through the end of April, the first four months of the year, were still 1% better than 2019. So even though April numbers were really bad, we were taking the punch and we were holding in there. But the problem obviously was obvious. All of the contracts closed in the month of April were the deals that were inked at the end of February and the few that were closed in March. We could see that pending contracts for May were going to be down significantly because there wasn't much business being done in April. New listings dropped by 26%, so the bad inventory numbers got worse. And median sale prices, though they were up 5%, were off in a few areas, down 14% in Irving, which was hard for anyone to explain, and down 35% in the park cities. The luxury market really took a break when the pandemic hit. The uncertainty was probably the worst part of April. Some of you will remember, if you spend much time on Facebook or elsewhere on social media, during the months of March and April, there were a lot of people in our industry, which is very competitive, 
people who wanted to stand out as opinion leaders or influencers who would take to Facebook and up these grandiose, overwrought, overblown, melodramatic predictions that this was the big shift, this was the change, everything was going to be different, real estate as we knew it was never going to be the same. It was all basically a lot of crap, and I was quietly over in the corner saying that, but you had a lot of people who said that what we got in April was pretty much what we were going to get the rest of the year. And May kind of bore that out. May was a really bad month. I say worse than Tex-Mex cuisine in Portland or anything else in Portland for that matter, but sales overall down 25% on a year over year basis. Dallas County hit particularly hard. Sales were off 35%. We didn't have it that great either at 29%. Prices dropped, but again, they didn't drop by the kind of numbers that a lot of the analysts were expecting. For North Texas overall, median sale price was off just 1%, and that was mainly because Dallas County just absolutely got its teeth kicked in. In Collin and Denton County, prices actually rose slightly, and in Tarrant, they rose just a little bit more than that. Inventory, though, continued to take a hit. They were off 27% in Collin County, 22% in Denton, you can see. That was really just a function of people not wanting to put their houses on the market. The good news for May was that we could look at pending contracts for June, and we could see that things were on their way back. And Leon mentioned uh, she lived outside Portland for a year, a few years. I'm not kidding about the Tex-Mex cuisine in Portland. The other thing I noticed is a lot of people up there, male and female, all look like John Lennon. That frightened me terribly, and I couldn't wait to get on a plane and get back to Dallas. But that aside, with the pendings for June going to be strong, we knew that June would be a good rebound. And it was. Anybody who gets the joke with that picture of Paul McCartney, text me 10 points for you. But in June, we had almost 12,000 homes sold, 16% better than June of 2019, and more importantly, a 40% increase over what we saw during the month of May. So we could see the market roaring back. It wasn't just that we were starting to reopen and that we had clarity as to what we could do in the industry. Part of it was that the mortgage rates had gone quite a bit lower. And what that did was it got a lot of first time home buyers off the sidelines, including millennials. You had a lot of people thinking, okay, this is temporary. Rates have gone down. This is when we've got to get back out there and buy because this may not last very long. But it brought a lot of people off of the sidelines and into the marketplace. So here we are through the first half of the year, six months, we were off only 2% from 2019, even though we'd had about two and a half months where really nothing happened. And pending contracts for July, 28% higher. So we knew that we were going to have another good month. The negative, of course, continued to be inventory, down 36% on a year-over-year -year level. But when the market came roaring back in June, you had a lot of folks in the media who wanted to know what was this all about. Um, somebody interviewed the great Mark Dotzer, who used to be one of the economists at the Real Estate Center at AM. If you know Mark, you know what I mean when I say it's like if Matthew McConaughey was a real estate economist, he's a blast to talk to. He was asked about why the market was doing what it was doing, what corner had been turned. And Mark's answer, there is no corner to be turned. This is just the continuation of the strong demand that has characterized our market for many, many months, if not years. People want to own houses. In other words, what Mark was saying, it's kind of paraphrasing what I said a little bit ago. We still had a fundamentally healthy market. And once we were reopened and ready to go, all of the demand just resumed. And so for the rest of the year, 2020 was like something, nothing really that we had ever seen. 14,000 homes sold in July, 25% increase. 12,000 homes sold in August, 11% year over year increase. 11.4 in September, a 27% increase year over year, biggest September in market history. Total third quarter sales, we're up 18.6% from 2019, the previous best year in the history of the market. And folks, the third quarter of 2019 is really what carried that year. So through nine months of the year, we'd sold 88,000 homes. That put us at 6% higher than the previous year. Median sale price went over 300,000, which was more than 80% better than the depths of our housing recession here in 2009, 2010. The increases were fueled by a number of factors. Part of it was the lower mortgage rates. People weren't paying as much to buy a home, so it made them feel comfortable that they could spend more on a home. They could buy more home because it was cheaper. It also resulted from bidding wars because the inventory was so bad, the demand was so strong, anything that went on the market was going to get bid up and that quickly jumped the prices. And that's one reason that we saw the increases that we did. Alas, inventory didn't get much better. It continued to be down, in this case, 40 to 45%, depending on where in the Metroplex you were from 2019. And the fourth quarter was just more of the same. October was a 25% year over year increase in sales. Median sale price again rising to over 300,000. 
despite the pandemic killing off April and May, this was an interesting statistic, I thought. When I first started working on this year's presentation, I was doing it in December, and the data that I had went through October. And one of the things I saw when I looked at October is that if you had sold no more homes that year, take away November and December, we were still looking at the fourth best year in the history of our market because we'd sold that many homes. But we got 9,400 in November, 23% year over year better. 108,000 homes sold through November. Pause and think about that for a moment. An 8% increase over where we were through the first 11 months of 2019, we had already set the new record. Had we not had a single home close in December, we already had the best year of the history of the market. So bottom line, December was just a great big old victory lap for our industry. And when December was over and the smoke was cleared, we had new best year in the history of the market. 119,000 homes sold. 10% better than 2019. For Dallas Plano Irving, if you want to look at our side of the Metroplex, a 9.8% increase. For Collin County, a 10.9% increase in homes sold in the best year of the history of our market. Total dollar volume, just under 40 billion for the Metroplex overall, just about 28 billion for Dallas Plano Irving. And here in Collin County, $7.5 billion sold. That is an 18% increase. Good year to be a realtor in Collin County. Certainly better than being a realtor in, say, Flint, Michigan, right? You feel me? Median sale price when the smoke was clear, up 6.4% for DFW overall, up 6.5% for Dallas Plano Irving. Average sale price up almost 10% up 9.5 in Collin County. So however you want to slice it, even with about two months of time out, we had one hell of a year in DFW. These charts give you some of graphic representation. I get these from the Real Estate Center at Texas A&M, and you can all find them there, but they show you a year-over-year -year comparison for 2018, 2019, and 2020. What you'll see, first off, is what I was talking about with respect to January, February. It was a great, great couple of months, but they were made to look better because February and January of 2019 maybe weren't so hot. Then you can see the extent of the drop off in April and May when the market kind of shut down. And then finally, you can look and see just what kind of rebound we had during the third and fourth quarter. So there's Dallas Fort Worth overall. Here's Dallas Plano Irving, our side of the Metroplex. And in particular, look at that July. Look at how much stronger it was than July of 2019. Collin County, same dynamic. It was an absolutely crazy third and fourth quarter, July, September, and October being particularly strong. Here's Dallas County. Um, I circle April and May so you can see the extent of the drop-off. When the market shut down for April and May, you can see the drop-off there. It hit Dallas County a lot worse than it hit Collin, Denton, or the other surrounding counties. Uh, Denton County, you can see the rebound during the second half of the year. It was significant. And there in Tarrant County, you can see, again, the same basic pattern, but they didn't get as strong of a start just because, you know, for whatever reason, I think it was probably just lack of affordable inventory, kind of chilled the transaction volume during that first quarter. And thereafter, they had their drop and they had their recovery. But however you look at it, pretty good year. This is the 2020 Netris data. A lot of you know how I do this because I've been doing it for years. I crunch the numbers where you have a single digit increase that's uh, denoted with yellow. Green is a double digit, 10 to 19% increase. If we're in the 20s, that's blue. And the purple is, holy God, what the hell happened here? And as you can see, looking at the first page of these numbers, price is up almost everywhere. The only outlier on this page being Oak Lawn, which is kind of condo heavy, which may help to explain it. But you see significant increases in sales and dollar volume in most of these areas where you don't, like Carrollton or Coppell, for example, it's not a function of no interest in the market. It's a simple matter of there being no inventory there for sale. Uh, I can tell you, you got to the point where, in particularly in, in Carrollton, after several strong years, there just wasn't anything affordable on the market. And if there's nothing for sale, nothing is going to get sold. So that's why Carrollton had kind of a down year. Then you go to the second page. Farmer's Branch, obviously, very picked over because it's been very trendy. Grand Prairie, Hearst, and Lake Dallas, same dynamic, just no inventory. But look, the prices went up almost everywhere, and in some cases significantly. And here's that third page. Take a look at Plano. Plano is a market that had been kind of stagnant for several years during the middle part of the last decade. Sales up almost 10%, dollar volume up nearly 20 and prices up significantly. 
Prosper, absolutely crazy, 12 and 20. You know, throughout Collin County in particular, a very strong year. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the issue of price appreciation. I mentioned when I was talking about predictions for 2020, how this little guy in the corner of the slide that you see, George Rea 2, was predicting that prices in the Metroplex were going to drop. I was incredulous when I read this at the beginning of 2020, particularly since it wasn't accompanied by a whole lot of analysis. But in retrospect, it looks like George made all the wrong assumptions. The first thing he had thought was that we were going to get a big glut of new listings. Uh, anybody raise your hand if we saw a glut of new listings where you were last year. I don't see any hands. Exactly. And I guess the other thing George thought was that somehow demand was going to evaporate. Neither of those things happened. What did happen last year was not a drop in prices, but an increase of $38 billion in home values last year. We are now the fourth most valuable housing market in the United States. The reality, guys, is this. Demand was strong and getting better, and prices were being forced up even before the pandemic hit. When the pandemic hit, you had people desperate to get out of mismanaged, ravaged areas to a place where people and government were sane. And as a result, we had even more in migration in North Texas than we've seen for the last decade, and we've seen quite a bit of it. The moral of the story, if you are looking for predictions or projections about what our housing market is going to do in a given year, avoid national platform people like the folks that work for national publications, avoid Yankees who don't understand the North Texas economy, and take with a grain of salt the would-be social media influencers. Look for the people that are actually boots on the ground paying attention to this stuff, because we all could have told you prices weren't going to drop. In fact, we did. Sorry, George. Here's your rice a -roni. Thanks for playing. Another moral of the story, to use a joke I've used before, never trust an economist who isn't old enough to remember rotary dial telephones. That said, let's talk a little bit about residential construction. Builders were on the same roller coaster all the rest of us were. New home sales and starts were pretty good in January, February, but then everything tanked in the second quarter. Fortunately for the builders, the combination of low mortgage rates, interest from millennials and people moving in, and then a change in attitudes about where we live fueled a big comeback in the third quarter. One of the things that really helped builders is people realized that they didn't necessarily need to live in Dallas County if they worked in Dallas County. Because so many of us were and now forever will be working remotely, what a lot of people ended up doing is deciding, hey, I can buy in Denton or Collin County. I can go buy in Savannah or Providence or Little Elm or Prosper or whatever, even though the company I work for may be downtown in Dallas. And so with this change in attitudes, builders had a remarkable turnaround in the third quarter. And you can see the quote in this bar here. Can't believe the velocity of houses sold this year. Builders selling twice as fast as they're building. We had more than 13,000 starts in each the third and fourth quarters. Those were increases of 34 and 51% over 2019. For the year, DFW area home builders started just under 48,000 new units. That's a 33% increase year over year. But more importantly, it's just 3,000 less than the previous best year for builders in the history of our market, which was in 2006. Builders went crazy that year with 51,000 new starts. We aren't quite back to that level for a lot of reasons, but it shows you that builders have made a nice recovery. The early returns in 2021 show starts off a little bit. That is more than anything a function of economics, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But I wanna mention that new home closings for the fourth quarter almost 11,000 to 29% increase. And for the year 42,500, that's almost a 21% increase over 2019. So builders had a tremendous, tremendous year. The big concern for builders going into 21% or 20, to 21, 2021, easy for you to say, First off, higher costs of labor and raw materials. Steel and lumber are going through the roof right now, and that is definitely having an impact on builders. Um, they just don't have all the labor they need to get as many starts in place. Interest rate hikes have them worried. And then lot inventory is kind of the big thing. It's one thing to have open land, but it's another thing to have open land that is ready to be built on. And we're kind of coming up against the limits there. And analysts are saying that's one of the things slowing new construction. We'll talk a little bit about apartments. Not extensively. The point that I always make is that apartments are kind of a good bellwether. When rents go up, people move out. And when our occupancy rates are high, rents go up and thus people move out. What we have in Dallas Metroplex now is kind of a bifurcated market. 
In parts of the Metroplex, we've totally overbuilt. You go down, for example, into North Oak Cliff and the Bishop Arts District, they put up so many big new complexes that they aren't able to fill them all. In the meantime, though, here in Collin, Denton, Collin in particular, but Collin and Denton counties, you've got so many people moving here from out of state and they can't find houses that they're taking apartments. So right now we continue to build ridiculous numbers of apartments in order to accommodate the new residents. But these are not your typical apartment dwellers. These aren't the college kids that are just staying in the, uh, the Jefferson complex for lack of a plan. These are people that are finding a place to land and looking to buy a house. So the apartments are actually a pretty good source of nascent demand for those of you that are looking for buyer business. And it's worth noting that there are a number of communities in Collin County where there are now more people renting than buying. Plano, Frisco, and McKinney are included in that number. And uh, Frisco and McKinney in particular, number one and number two in the nation in new apartment construction. So uh, we watch apartments. It's a little different than the way that we've analyzed it in years past. But for those of us sitting where we do in Collin County, the number of people moving in is still a good source of potential demand for us. I want to talk a little bit about the big money the luxury buyers and of course the uh, foreign national investors. The luxury sector is defined as homes that are priced at more than a million dollars. And in the last four, well, four largest Texas markets, basically you've seen significant growth in that sector for most of the last decade. The high end did not do well when COVID started. A lot of the people who had those luxury listings decided to take a break. And so listings were off statewide, for example, by 24% in May. Prices were down slightly during that same period, but when the economy reopened, the demand definitely returned. The sales of luxury properties in Texas ended up totaling $10.3 billion for the year ending October 31st. For some reason, we don't have more recent data on that segment, although I expect we'll have it soon enough. But that's a 24% increase year over year. And overall, the luxury market accounted for almost 9% of all Texas home sales. So bottom line, even with COVID, the people who are going to spend more than a million dollars on their residential property felt pretty good about the market. That's a good sign for all of us. I'll um, never turn down a free Okay, uh, Zillow keeps track of the number of cities where the median sale price on residential property is a million dollars or more. Those are their million dollar cities. We now have four of them in the Metroplex, the two park cities, Westlake and Westover Hills, whereas we only had two really before this big run started. And even then it didn't go over a million in the park cities until I don't think like 2014 or 15. When it comes to foreign investment, we have always been a very strong market for foreign nationals who wanna buy real property. They were shrewd and they saw that North Texas was a good place to buy. We rank third now in international purchases. We are behind Florida and California. Um, overall, the market in North Texas among foreign investors has cooled a little bit. The reason is because these people are looking for bargains. They're buy low, sell high type of people. And with prices rising as much as they have here, Texas is no longer the bargain that it was maybe 10 years ago. And in the meantime, you have all of these areas where people are fleeing. So your foreign investor living in Singapore sees that prices are dropping in California or on the East Coast. They're betting on a comeback that may or may not come, but that's where a lot of the money is gonna go now. So we will continue to be a significant location for foreign investors, just not quite to the same extent that we have been in years past. That might not be such a bad thing for those of us that represent buyers. We won't have as many investors out in the field that we need to compete with. So total it all up, good year for 2020. Now let's talk a little bit about the bad news. The first thing we need to talk about is the housing inventory. Every year I have to get more creative to try to explain to people how bad our inventory situation is. So I was looking for comparators, metaphors, if you will. Um, I le learned, for example, that they're going to reboot the Sex in the City TV show. After I wiped the vomit away from my face, I thought, yeah, as hard as it is for me to say that, uh, the inventory picture is actually a little worse than more Sarah Jessica Parker. Um, I read a lot of history. I read about mustard gas attacks in World War I, and I have to say those are probably worse than the current inventory situation. I got my answer on New Year's Eve watching Ryan Seacrest when uh, Cindy Lauper and Billy Porter kind of staggered through the worst version of a song I've ever heard. I think that pretty much nails it. Cindy Lauper's performance on New Year's Eve, dreadful, horrible, and just about as bad as our inventory situation here in the Metroplex. Inventory is at the lowest level ever. Going into December, the supply of active pre-owned listings was at 1.4 months, just over 13,300. 
At year end, that number had dropped to just over 9,000 for the two dozen counties in the Netris reporting area. If you think about a market at equilibrium, 40, 50, 60,000 listings, which we would have seen you know, 10, 15 years ago, that is remarkable. As it was, we were down 50% year over year. Pending contracts at the end of December were 8,200. So we knew that January would further deplete what inventory there was. And just to break it down further, coming into the year, 4,500 listings total in Dallas County, 1,770 in Collin County, 1,650 in Denton County. So bad, but really bad when you break it down by price point. It's one thing to say that we have a 1.1 month supply in Collin County. If I'm looking at 650,000 or above, I'm going to have some things to choose from. But what am I going to find if I'm looking at less than 350? There is nothing. We don't talk about it in terms of month supply. We talk about it in terms of make an offer before the news. You time it with a stopwatch. Let's talk a little bit about the virus. In Texas, as of this morning, we are at 2.74 million cases. Deaths are at just under 47,000. The mortality rate in Texas is holding steady at about 1.6, trending down from 1.7, 1.8 in prior months. So we do appear to be getting our arms around it. You can see this chart here that I copied off the screen this morning. You see the early peak in June, July. You see another peak in December. And now you see where we were. We're at just about the lowest level we've been since the outbreak started in earnest a year ago. So the caseload is getting to be more manageable. Break it down by county. You can see the number of cases and the number of deaths. What I think is significant, Collin County is much lower than the other counties in the Metroplex. 85,300 some cases but only 770 deaths. We're at less than a 1% mortality rate in Collin County. Uh, you know, For what that's worth, I, we can take a little comfort in that. We've also had more than 2.5 million recoveries. Nobody talks about that. There are probably, I bet 20 people on this call that have had it. Some of us didn't even know it. I had it last month. It did not prove to be much of anything. We're getting our arms around this virus. The vaccine developed in the last administration is being distributed. There are some bumps in the process, but as of March 5th, we'd just given under 5 million doses with 1.5 Texans fully vaccinated. Those numbers are surely higher this morning. The current level of hospitalizations down 50% from its peak in early February. So bottom line, it's gonna to continue to be a factor, but obviously we seem to have uh, gotten it under control to enough of an extent that Governor Abbott feels free to reopen the economy. We're gonna to have to continue to be careful, but I don't think anyone feels like we really have to shut the economy down again. And that may be a good little boost in terms of momentum. Let's talk a little bit about the national economy. This worries me. It generally does. Every year I'll talk about the market and how great I feel about it. But most years I'm always a little apprehensive when we talk about the national economic picture. If we talk about GDP growth, I feel pretty good. We had a horrible second quarter. When the economy shut down nationwide, GDP, which had been clocking along at 3 4% growth, dropped by 31%. We then rebounded in the third quarter with 33% growth. That's what we call the V-shaped recovery, big down, big up. Uh, and then the fourth quarter, second estimate, which came out a few weeks ago, shows that in the fourth quarter, we grew by 4.1%. Now, when the year end numbers were released, the Wall Street Journal did something that I thought was truly graceless. The headline on the front page was that the economy contracted by 2.4% during 2020, and they made it sound like this was cause for crepe hanging and all manner of depression and, and perhaps even jumping off of buildings. But the context is critical. If you told me when the economy was shut down in April and May that we would still come out just 2.4% down, I'd have been pretty happy with that, and so would most financial analysts. So that 2.4% drop that the journal said was such a terrible thing, understood after a 31% contraction in the second quarter, hell, that's a success story, but that's the way the media operates. They never give you the positive, they always give you the negative. First quarter projections are good. 1.9%, according to the Wall Street Journal survey of economists, I'm reading people who think it may be more like three or 4%, enough growth, you actually have people worried about inflation. The Dow is something that concerns me a little bit. This morning, the Dow is getting close to an unbelievable level. We could break 33,000. We were at 32.9 just after 11 o'clock. It was a big week last week. But here's the thing. If you read some of the guys that don't get quoted on CNN or in the Wall Street Journal, there are people who are concerned. For example, if you go to zerohedge.com and read the Durden report, there are people who talk about 
what stocks are doing. And one of the things that I latched onto a month or so ago is noticing that if you look at the standard and poor 500, better than 90% of the stocks on the S&P 500 are trading significantly above their 21 day moving averages. That is an indicator that stocks may be very, very overvalued. The other thing that this report that I read notes is we've only had that phenomenon six times in our economy's history. And each time it was followed by a great big correction. So there are a lot of people who are saying, yeah, stocks look great right now. Don't count on that being the case all year. It might stay positive, but check your euphoria. A lot of people saying good time to get out of the Dow. Unemployment went to 14.7% in April with everybody losing their jobs. 6 to 2% in February of this year. So we're gradually fighting back. We added almost 380,000 new jobs last month, but the momentum is kind of slow. We were at basically full employment in March of last year before the pandemic hit. Unemployment was at 3% and a lot of that was just people moving from job to job. We definitely still have some issues with getting back to full employment. Oil and energy in general. We went from $65 a barrel January of last year to a record low of negative 40 in April of 2020. And a lot of that was due to futures trading, not just because you know nobody valued oil. Clearly, it was just they were trading on the value of contracts, bet on at a different time. But oil has rebounded. Uh, this morning at about 11 o'clock, we were at $64 a barrel. Here's where we are. <clears throat> a lot of people in New England think that uh, the energy industry is a big deal to Dallas. And it's not because we just don't have that many jobs dependent on industry. With oil at $64 a barrel, the companies that produce oil and gas are still going and exploring. They're not laying people off, but prices haven't risen to the kind of levels that we've seen before. Y'all may remember when gas was 450 a gallon in the summer of 2007. We're not anywhere close to that. We're still able to get gas for a relatively low price. 250, I think, is what I paid at a quick trip yesterday. And this is good for us because if we're spending less on gasoline, you've got more money to spend on groceries or margaritas or come to that housing. And if Walmart and Target and Kroger are paying $2.50 to a gallon per gas, it's costing them less to bring lettuce and milk and bread to the market, which means we spend less on groceries. So energy prices where they are, are a good thing for us. It gives us more disposable income. The problem is that, and all of you can see this, gas prices are on the way up. They're up better than 40 cents a gallon on average since the beginning of 2021. And it looks like they're headed even higher. The new administration, and I say this not from a partisan political stance, but just from somebody who studies objectively the impact of policy on economics, the new administration wants to do some things with energy policy that are going to make gas and electricity more expensive for everybody and will make fossil fuels more expensive for everybody. And as the law of unintended consequences kick in and we're paying more for all of those other things, that's going to have a dampening effect on the economy. Some of us know it, some of us don't, some of us know it and don't care, but that may be what we're looking at in 2021. Business confidence is now better than it was at pre-pandemic levels and certainly better than it was during the pandemic, 60.8 in February. Here's the problem. We don't have numbers that read the impact of the business community on the White House's plan to increase taxes. Currently on the table is the largest tax increase since 1993. It would raise the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. It would significantly raise taxes on people and businesses earning more than $400,000. That's the thing that business feared about this possible administration to begin with. Now that it's out there, I don't think the business confidence numbers are going to stay as high as they are throughout the year. There's also concern about the housing debt bubble, in part because of the fallout associated with COVID. The theory a year ago was that because people were going to lose their jobs, they would wind up getting foreclosed on. And I heard a lot of people in our market talking about that. And yet that's not really how it has played out. I learned this morning, looking on the Dallas Morning News' website, foreclosures were down 85% in February. People in our area aren't losing their homes because of COVID. The biggest reason is because so many of them have equity because of the price increases that we've seen. Everybody's home is worth more, considerably more than when they bought it. And so as a result, you got more equity just by virtue of staying there. So for a lot of people in the Metroplex, if they wind up in a situation where they can't pay their mortgage, they aren't necessarily going to get foreclosed on. They're more likely to put their home on the market so that they can sell, capture the equity that they had, and get out from under the mortgage. They'll do a forbearance or they'll do that. So we're not seeing the foreclosures that a lot of people predicted, but there were some of us who were telling you last year that wasn't going to be the case. The problem when we talk about housing debt and housing bubble is a little different. 
we've been hearing for years that residential property is overvalued. We hear it nationwide, and we also have those geniuses at the Fitch Rating Service saying properties are overvalued here in the Metroplex. Fitch's whole bit, and I've alluded to this before, they think that property is overvalued in Dallas-Fort Worth because of problems in the energy industry. What they don't understand is that energy is less than 1.5% of the jobs in the Metroplex. Basically, their understanding of the Dallas-Fort Worth economy is limited to what they learned watching Larry Hagman in 1982. We are not an energy town. We're a service industry town. We have a whole lot of stuff going on. We're a tech sector now. But bottom line, there are still people who think property is overvalued here in the Metroplex. If you look at the 2020 numbers, it adds to the concern. First off, according to CoreLogic, prices rose 8.2% for the year. They project at least another 2.5 for the current year. And candidly, I think we're going to see them go up more than that. According to Zillow, there are now more than 300 cities where the median sale price or median value of property is more than a million dollars. We added 45 last year alone. This to point out that prices are going up at a ridiculous rate. Now let's put this in practical terms. In 2018, home prices reached a milestone we hadn't seen since 2004. The measurement is kind of hard to explain succinctly, but when you look at the ratio of what people are paying on a mortgage for a median sale priced home relative to what they earn, that ratio is now at the highest level we've seen since 2008. In other words, what it costs to pay your mortgage relative to what you earn has gone up at a level that we have not seen in over a decade, right around the time we had another crash. And that's got a lot of people concerned especially when you consider government policies that may be fueling the debt bubble. The analysts at Goldman Sachs did a paper in January that was pretty good reading. What they do is they note that the combination of the feds buying mortgage-backed securities, ridiculously low interest rates, non-existent supply and high demand may be putting us to a point where we drive housing prices to the bubble level, and then we're going to have a very big issue. Now, is that a problem nationwide? Yeah, quite probably. Is it a problem in Texas? I would say not necessarily. One of the reasons is because the fundamentals of the demand in Texas. We don't have investors buying property in Texas the way that we did in 2007 and 2008. The people that are buying in our market today are buying here because they are moving here because they want to live here. And because they have an interest in keeping their property, they're not gonna walk away from it when the market turns like the investors did 12, 13 years ago. Uh, as Dr. Jim Gaines from the Real Estate Center at A&M put it, the market that we saw 12, 13 years ago was the product of, quote, using his phrase, irrational exuberance, end of quote. This is a market with strong demand with solid fundamentals, which means we are less likely to suffer a bubble kind of collapse. But it's still something that has a lot of people concerned. So with all of that said, what are we looking for in 2021? Well, first off, we've had a good start to the year, if nothing else, and we need to talk a little bit about that. January was another record month, 7,000 pre-owned homes sold. That was 10% higher than 2020. So remember me telling you earlier what a strong January we had in 2020. January of this year, stronger even than that. Now, February was sort of a step back. The numbers were just released late last week. The big freeze kind of screwed things up. We had about 10 days where nothing happened, mainly because none of us could go anywhere and because none of us had any power. And then, of course, we had concerns over whether there were burst pipes, whether there was flooding, how much damage had been done to the new listing. And that really slowed down the process. It's kind of funny. I was talking to a couple moving here from Massachusetts, um, probably the 13th or 14th. Now, it was the day the snow got really bad. They were concerned that the snow was going to prevent them from doing a final walkthrough on, I think they said, February 26th or something like that. And I was telling them, I don't think you need to worry. All of the snow is going to be gone probably by this weekend. They didn't believe me, but they just are going to live in Texas and they're going to come to understand. We had severe weather. It went away pretty quickly, but the market still felt the impact. Sales were down about 8% year over year from February. Still, though, nearly 7,000, which is a pretty good market. And what we also saw is that a lot of February sales wound up getting pushed to March. We've got just over 8,200 pending contracts to close this month, new ones being signed every day. So the March numbers ought to show a rebound and put us back on pace. Another thing we know that's driving the market is population growth. There have been a lot of articles written about the number of people moving here, not just from California, but places like Arizona, New Mexico, Louisiana, Florida, other southern states, and certainly Illinois, Pennsylvania, Minnesota. So the population growth 
continues to drive demand. And regardless of other externalities, that means there's going to be a lot of pent up demand. As a result, price jumps have been ridiculous. 14% increase in median sale price for North Texas overall in February. And some January numbers show you a 15% increase in Dallas and Ellis County, 11.4 in Collin, 11.6 in Kaufman, really everywhere in the Metroplex, prices going up significantly. Inventory, which as we know, sucks, continues to suck even more. We now have a 68% drop in inventory numbers. And I have that number listed as 69.58. That is an error on my part. It's actually something more like 66.50. Um, I was updating the slide and I missed that one, but we are down 68% from inventory levels in February last year. It's not getting better. The positives are this. You don't live in Scranton, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. You don't live in Grand Island, Nebraska. You live here. And the Texas economy, although it's struggling, is actually faring pretty well. We added 107,000 jobs in August, 40,000 more in September. Job growth is slow, but it's still there. Now, the unemployment rate did something interesting. It went to 8.1% in October, up from 6.7% in August, which had a lot of people concerned. But the reason for the spike is that you had people getting back into the labor market after losing their jobs. And when you go back into the labor market and you're looking if you don't have anything, then you count differently. And so it makes the number look higher. But when you talk about unemployment in Texas, understand that it's income level sensitive. For low wage income earners, people making 27,000 or less, it was a bad hit. These are the people in retail and in food service, jobs like that. A lot of people there are still looking for work. But if you look at the median to high wage earners, people 28,000 and above, we're actually about where we were in January of 2020. So for the most part, the economy has recovered. Certainly, if we're talking about the people that are more likely to go out and want to buy homes, they're about where they were. So the Texas economy, though it's not looking as good on paper as it did a year ago, for our purposes, it's just fine. The population growth, I mentioned it a little bit ago. Here's some numbers. Per census data, we leave the nation in new residents for the year ending July 31. I don't know why they can't do their data December 31 like the rest of us. We have to do it on a split calendar. But for the middle of the year, we had 373, almost 374,000 new residents. That's move-ins and it's natural births, but it's a 1.3% increase. Statewide population, just under 30 million. And we're now the number two U-Haul destination. According to U-Haul, when they rent trucks, they ask where you're taking it. We're number two. Nashville, for some reason, seems to be ahead of us right now, but it shows you the number of people moving to Texas. I read something this morning. It was a report on population growth in Texas. I didn't have time to scribble down the source, and I've got it on screen, but I can't get to it because I'm sharing my screen, that says we will have overtaken Chicago and will be the third largest market in the nation by 2030. So uh, we're, we're really growing at a ridiculous rate, and all of that bodes well for us. The other thing fueling this growth is as people learn that they can work remotely, they can live anywhere they want, regardless of where their employer is, people are choosing to come here. I know a couple, for example, anecdotally, who moved here from San Diego, even though that's where their employer is, because it's a better deal for them here. It is just a quality of life issue for a lot of folks. And if they can work remotely, they just as soon do it here as anywhere else. And that has led to a lot more people moving in. And finally, it's business is coming too. One thing that I thought was interesting last year, CBRE, one of the biggest commercial real estate brokerages, moved from LA to the Metroplex, in part because it's a kind of a central location, easier to fly places from here, but also because they see the growth that's coming, where people are living, businesses move, and there's an opportunity for them. So we are fueling growth. We are well positioned for growth. The demand is definitely there. Our tech sector, third in the nation for December job postings, we in the Metroplex are the number one or among the top markets rather for new construction jobs in 2020. I think we were number two or three nationwide. Statewide though, that's a lower number. So they're, they're building more here in the Metroplex than they are elsewhere. We remain one of the top markets for millennials. The 28 to 36 age group is one of the biggest demographics in our market right now. We've noted in the past that Generation Z is starting to buy homes. So a lot of young people think this is a good place to be. And we know anecdotally that it's not just the jobs. I've alluded to this a couple of times now. There are people moving to the Metroplex because they want to get away from lockdowns, wildfires, riots, 
uh, craziness that you're seeing in so many other states. And all of us, if we think about it, have had these conversations with somebody. Uh, one thing that will stand out to me, I was playing golf with my son in November, and we got paired with a young couple from Oregon. And we weren't sure how to talk to people from Oregon because we knew there was a possibility that we might be on opposite sides of every issue. So we kind of danced around it. And then at the second tee box, the female half of the couple said, and just so you know, we couldn't get the hell out of Portland fast enough. And that waved the way for some good conversation. But people want to be here because they don't like the way it is elsewhere. A lot of us fear that growth and that change because we're afraid that it will change Texas. What I'm finding is a lot of the people moving here from elsewhere kind of think like we do and hopefully it stays that way. The big drawing cards remain the same. Good weather, reasonably uh, priced cost of living, strong transportation, no state income tax, and of course, affordable housing. Now we may not be as affordable as we were, but relative to say the West Coast and the East Coast, the hard coasts, we're still in pretty good shape. So where is all of this going this year? What are we going to see in 2021? First, let's talk a little bit about interest rates. We may see them fluctuate a little here and there. For example, first week of January, we saw about a 20 basis point increase one day, and it had a lot of people thinking rates were on the way back up. And it was really more just a response to stuff going on elsewhere in the bond market. They were back down later. We will see days and weeks where interest rates may be up a little bit, but by and large, we do not expect mortgage rates to increase significantly this year. Lawrence Yoon says they stay in the threes. It may be the higher threes, but still the threes by the end of the year. No indication that the Fed is going to raise interest rates. The signals are that because of the pace of growth being somewhat tentative, they will keep interest rates where they are. A lot depends on COVID and the vaccination and how quickly the vaccine is distributed. The consensus though, is that we should have COVID under control by the end of the year, which means it shouldn't have a tremendous adverse impact on the housing market. Certainly it does not appear to be a, a big negative factor here in the Metroplex. The new economic paradigm, I've talked about this a couple times in passing, is cause for concern. And again, I don't think of this as Democrat or Republican. I think of this in terms of how it will impact what we do for a living. And I don't like some of the policies that are being bandied about by the folks in Washington, but the good news is that whatever they do, it likely won't kick in this year. If they get anything done, and it's not clear that they will, it would be the sort of thing that would take effect maybe next year in 2022. So having real impact on the economy as opposed to a perception impact, we probably are okay, meaning they can't screw up anything this year. Talk to me next year, we'll see. National Association of Realtors, Dr. Yoon and his folks predict a 5 to 10% increase in sales nationwide. The asterisk is that that's going to depend on inventory because they have the same problems elsewhere in the country now that we do. Here at home, Realtor.com and a few others are saying another year of 10% sales growth, double digits. I'm saying tap the brakes a little on that because the inventory situation is as bad as it is. We think sales will increase perhaps significantly. We think though that the extent of the increase is probably closer to four to five percent, six at the top end rather than 10%. But either way, probably another best year in the history of the market. It's really just we're arguing about the Delta at this point. Price increases. This concerns me. I do not routinely disagree with the folks at CoreLogic. They generally are right on the ball. They see prices dropping by 1% this year, and I do not know the conditions of that projection, but I don't see anything in the crystal ball that leads to that conclusion. We can already see that prices have increased this year, even with February being a slow month for transactions, prices went up significantly. So I'm not sure where they get a 1% drop in prices, and we don't agree. We think continued demand, horrible supply will mean more upward pressure on prices. And so we're thinking at least a 5% increase in median sale price for the Metroplex based on what we saw in January and February could be closer to 10. So bottom line, another record year in terms of sales because of the price growth, another record year in terms of dollar volume and yes, more price increases here in the Metroplex demand strong in all sector. Bottom line kids, we learned with the interest rate adjustments in 2019 and with the pandemic last year, how quickly everything can get kicked over on its tail. But as long as the economy doesn't wind up going completely socialist, as long as interest rates don't completely rocket, if things remain more or less as they are, we think the market is positioned so that everybody can have a good year. It's not gonna look like great years in the past. Those of you that are listing agents, are not gonna have that whiteboard in your office with 15 properties listed at once like you might have in 2010 or 11. 
but you're still going to be able to sell properties pretty quickly if you price them right. You're going to make your money. You're just going to have to think a little differently because it does not look like the market that we have seen 10 years ago, even five years ago. And I'm not saying that everybody here is going to have the best year in the history of their career. It just doesn't work that way. But everybody can. All of the fundamentals are in place. So bottom line, I don't know how much longer this lasts. And I've been saying that for several years now. But I think we've got one more good year. If nothing else, it's a little Chinese proverb, may you live in interesting times. And actually, you know what, as an aside, that's not a Chinese proverb. Robert F. Kennedy said that in a speech somewhere and said it was a Chinese proverb, but that was apocryphal. Either way, the sentiment's the same. May we live in interesting times? We certainly do. Whatever happens in 2021, we're going to have an awfully good time with it. Uh, if there's anything that I or my team at Chicago Title can do to help you in the year to come, it would certainly be our pleasure and our privilege. With that, I'll shut up and I'll take questions if there are any, um, and I will stop sharing screen. If there. anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself or raise your hand or put it in the chat. The Q&A function is missing, so feel free to speak up. I'm just sort of reading the comments as they scroll. Yeah, I think so many sellers are nervous to sell because they don't want to become buyers in this market. Yes, that is exactly right. I see that dynamic playing a bigger factor than anything right now. It becomes sort of a self-perpetuating thing. And other than that, I don't see a lot of questions. Here's what I will offer you. Sometimes you think of the question later. I know we all have that tendency. And if you do, hell, feel free to email me. My email address has been posted once. I'll do it again. In fact, I'm typing it in right now. So again, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint, email me. If you've got questions about what I was saying, yeah, Krista gave the email right before me. So my email address is all over this damn chat bar. You guys ought to be good if you want to get a hold of me. But thank you all very much for having me. Uh, I always appreciate being a part of this. You know, to me, I, I really felt like a significant human being in this community when CCAR first asked me to do this. That was probably 11, 12 years ago. And now it's kind of a recurring invitation. I always consider it an honor just as I consider it an honor to do whatever I can for any or all of you. So y'all take care. Thank you very much.